What's up, my miners of intelligence and consciousness? I'm Rick Brooks, and this is Rick's Mind. This week, I sit down with Ben Carollo, former Air Force officer and host of Galaxy Brain on the Young Turks Twitch channel. Enjoy the conversation. Ben, welcome to the show, brother. Yeah, good to be on the show. How's it going? Dude, living the dream, man. Living the dream. So... I really appreciate you doing this, man. I uh, Yesterday, I just actually recorded a crazy podcast uh, with Laszlo, um, who's the host of the China History Podcast. So we'll probably get into China at some point. That's like pretty burned into my mind. And your background as a former Air Force intelligence analyst, like that, I feel like that might pair very, very well with that. So I'm wondering, like, I'm very ignorant to what you did in your past life so if you kind of walk us through that and and possibly your decision to join the air force as well yeah let's see uh that's kind of a lot to go to so uh, i guess why i decided to join the military that's the easiest launch point i was this super like gung-ho patriotic young kid and uh i joined the military it was a way to you know pay for college and sort of like uh you know, what I viewed as kind of really the only option. And I, after I joined, I basically started working with the drone program immediately as an intelligence analyst. So I was literally the guy like watching the screen, telling everybody what's going on. From there, uh, things kind of changed for me a lot. I mean, especially politically speaking, I kind of saw a lot of really awful stuff. And I saw the United States doing a lot of really awful stuff. Definitely got a lot more doomer about about U.S. foreign policy. And so I did that for a while. Um, after four years active duty, I traded the last two years for being four years in the Guard, where I did cybersecurity. And then I got like politically active. I ran a few, like I ran a congressional campaign, state senate campaign. Um, I ran for office myself. And then around that, I finished my master's degree, which brings us up to like a few months ago. And during that time, I had started streaming on Twitch. Which is what led me to getting the the job with TYT, doing like some content for them. And for our listeners that might know, no, that's the that's the Young Turks. Um, one of the thing, I mean, if you don't mind getting into what what sort of things did you see that kind of made you on that unnerved you? Well, there's kind of a lot to go into without getting like too heavy. Um, it's okay, man. We the, can get heavy. That's what this show's about. Like, I literally saw, like, I had to literally get in arguments with some of my coworkers when I was working with drones. Um, I had to literally get in arguments with them as to why it's not okay to refer to literal children playing soccer as military aged males. Um, like, and that was far too much of the time while I was in. Like, that was like, way too much of a regular occurrence seeing things like that happen um and then kind of like knowing what the office was like when i wasn't in there pushing back against what the people were saying and doing fuck that is heavy um i have a cousin that drove a striker and some of the stories that came out of his deployments in iraq not being able to stop the convoy no matter what is kind of just disturbing as well um that would definitely be heavy i i yeah that's that's definitely not ideal did you have i mean obviously you you probably had people that were on the same wavelength as you like we you you know or were you kind of the black sheep of the unit um i can say there was well there was one other person um and when he got out of the military, uh, we'd both gotten out of the military at roughly the same time, at least in terms of out of du- uh, active duty. And uh, he ran for Congress. That's whose congressional campaign I actually ended up running because, you know, we were sort of two out of probably two or three dozen people um, who were like sort of pushing against um, a lot of people were apathetic and they were just kind of like, whatever, I don't care anyway. Um, either way, it's just a job. Um, and then like us two were probably outnumbered like four to one in terms of like, you know, we're saying be patient, you know, try to know what's going on. Like, don't just kill random people. And then 
you know, you'd get, because I mean, because there's a lot of racism, right? Like, I mean, and that ultimately is what it boils down to, is it's a lot of racism. There are literally a lot of people who their mentality was that uh, because somebody uh, was from the Middle East, right, because they weren't white, um, that somehow that meant that they were destined to grow up to be a terrorist, even if, you know, they're just a kid playing soccer. And so that's what really just fueled a lot of their um, sort of trigger happy attitude towards you know people living in like iraq and afghanistan yeah definitely understand and and then you add another layer on that to where you're removed you're several degrees removed from actually killing someone like there's certain degrees of of killing right like hand-to-hand obviously is the most intense then you have you know riflemen being able to see someone take them out that way and then there's artillery and then a layer back from that would be sitting on a computer screen and watching it live time not to say that that doesn't fuck you up right um but it's still very far removed and there's some ethical questions uh in that as well i mean war is is essentially state-sponsored murder and it's terrible and we should never do it but um i mean this is the world that we live in is we're using technology to kind of do the dirty work. And there's a lot of interesting arguments against that um, because there could be, there's several cases in World War II where you'd have, there's one that comes to mind, DeMarco pulled this up. It was, I believe it was a German pilot that had just all of his buddies had died. It was towards the end of the war. And he saw, I believe it was an American pilot that was like, kind of limping back and he he had a chance to kill him but he just had had seen enough was it uh him. the charlie brown and franz stiegler incident yes it was franz franz ended up being a brain surgeon and moved to canada correct uh if that's, let's see that up, but... it's uh charlie brown and franz stiegler incident occurred on december 20th 1943 After a successful bomb run on Bremen, 2nd Lieutenant Charles Brown, his B-57, was severely damaged by German fighters. Luftwaffe pilot Franz Stiegler had the opportunity to shoot down the crippled bomber, but did not do so and instead escorted over and past German-occupied territory to protect it. Yeah, he flew in the German formation. Yeah, and then it says, after an extensive search by Brown, the two pilots met each other 50 years later and developed a friendship that lasted until Stiegler's death in March uh, 2008. Yeah. So they're saying that you, when you kind of remove that human component, like, and there's still a human component, obviously, behind a drone, right? But like, when you remove that, the chances for you to maybe instead of take a life, maybe help it out are greatly reduced. And I think that's the argument. And and I, it's, it's very heartening to know that, like, that's where you were. You were like, maybe this is not right. And then not only that, like, it's very admirable that you're trying to change that policy. Is this a fight that continues today? Um, well, I mean, I haven't, uh, like, I haven't, obviously, like, I'm not in the military anymore. Um, I'm certain that there's people uh, who are having those same arguments. Um, I know that, like, when I got out, I mean, like, I mean, for example, when I got out and Donald Trump got elected, I kept track of the numbers, and I still had, like, Facebook friends um, who were still, like, really in it. And the amount of, like, civilian casualties literally doubled over the span of, like, the first month. And then I think quadrupled by the end of, like, the first, like, six months. Um, and it it seemed like from the people that I knew and was talking to that they had a very much more lax policy where they were taking things even less seriously. Um, and, you know, and to be entirely honest, like, I don't know how more people don't have that mentality that that i did of just trying to be patient and like understand what's going on because i mean like if you're an infantryman and you show up you fire a few rounds and then you leave um it's the people who are watching the drone feeds that are going to be sticking around like watching people clean up afterwards right um which you know that's that's it's you know it's It's one thing to be in conflict and leave, and then another thing to like be in conflict and then sit there and basically watch like the the result of of your actions and your decisions and um, the things that you've said and done for literally hours, right? Um, And uh, so I honestly don't know like how people get through their heads 
um like how they they sort of really justify it i guess like i don't know how people would like um uh, got in that mentality i think um you know it takes a lot of i think mental gymnastics um to to be as like gung ho and trigger happy as a lot of the people working with drones are but maybe there is something to, to the idea of like well if it's behind a screen people have a better easier time i guess um fictionalizing it in their minds where they take it less seriously where they they treat it like a video game um exactly when it's you know it's just literally real life you know i think that that is a big component and and not only that like your skin isn't as in the game because you can operate these drones from the united states right like is it, don't they have drone warehousing like in New Mexico and and stuff where you could or are you were you deployed um, overseas when you were operating these? Uh, I personally was overseas, um, but I was in Germany, um, okay. and so but yeah, they like they're they're all over the place. It's very much a remote thing, so it's not anything that necessitates you like physically being in Afghanistan or anything like that. Yeah, but you're also still, like you mentioned before, you're still, after our troops have withdrawn or whatnot, like or the battle's over, you're still doing surveillance. So you're watching on a screen the aftermath, the aftermath, the cleanup, all that shit, right? That's just getting, getting seared into your consciousness. Yeah. Yeah, that's not ideal. That's not ideal. Sorry, man, that's, that's no good. Um, one of the things I also wanted to kind of touch on is what what is biosecurity i have no I, I didn't even know that this was a field of study yeah so biosecurity is basically what we didn't do over the past two years um, <laughs> <laughs> um so biosecurity and biodefense is basically the emergency response slash counterterrorism aspect of public health um it is very much like you know, how do you respond to uh, new crop diseases coming from one country to another? Um, those are really big crop diseases. Um, that's where most of like the business around it is. Um, then you have obviously things like CDC, like doing pandemics, tracking, like what are the next diseases that are likely to become pan pandemics? You know, how, how are these things changing? But it, it looks at kind of like everything. So it's like, you know, our mosquito populations a risk, our bioterrorists a risks, you know, um, what are the ethics of, then you talk about like, you can go more focused in terms of laboratory, right? If you're working in a laboratory with, you know, particular pathogens, what type of security measures do you need to take to prevent the spread of those pathogens, right? What, mm -hmm. you know, PPE do you need? What uh, security protocols do you need for the people who get access to the lab so that you're not just letting randos come in there and work with like deadly pathogens um so it's kind of it's kind of the policy side i guess of public health of like preparation and response and it's very much um in, in the vein of how do we stop pandemics from happening how do we stop these you know natural disasters from spreading disease um and then how do we know how to prioritize our efforts because there's a lot of diseases out there and there's different ones that have different sort of risk levels um you know when it comes to another oh, okay another thing aspect to it is like um you know analyzing like okay um would a country be likely to use like a biological weapon or like a chemical weapon and like what defense systems do we have against that and what would we need what do we need to put in place um to mitigate that risk and so it's very much um just sort of everything along those lines in terms of sort of a bridge between public health and like counterterrorism. i guess if that makes sense yes it does make a lot of sense man um thank thank you for explaining that because i i didn't know i didn't know. i was very ignorant to that we we you started bringing up labs my brain instantly went to this lab leak hypothesis i'm 100% sold i believe that in 2020 what are your thoughts um no the lab leak hypothesis is 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 very very unlikely um and the reason for that is really simple like well, okay so there's a couple reasons for that first and foremost like the united states literally had scientists working in that lab side by side it's it was part of a partnership that had lasted for a very long time ever since the original sars um you know like sars one came around 
uh, people have been worrying about it. Coronavirus has been on the top of like watch lists uh, for like next pandemics for literally decades. Um, and so what the Eco Health Alliance was doing, which is one of the organizations that gets a lot of funding from the United States, um, they have like laboratories all over the place and they work in laboratories in places like Laos, Vietnam. They've got a ton of labs in China that they work with. Um, you have um, American doctors working with like Laotian, Vietnamese, Chinese doctors. Um, there's some in the Middle East. Um, I think there's one in like Central Africa and then like another one or two in South America. Uh, but they're all over the place. And there's like American scientists that work there and um, they just do surveillance and monitoring. Um, now, it's kind of a high risk job because basically whenever you're whenever you're going out to collect samples from bats you are exposing yourself to potential risk of getting the new strain of coronavirus but also you're mitigating the risk because you're feeding information into a pipeline that is necessary for vaccine development right we need to know what viruses are out there to develop vaccines before they spread it's one of the reasons why the vaccine rolled out so quickly is because it had been under development for about 10 years where they were trying to figure out, okay, how do we make a general purpose coronavirus vaccine? Um, you know, what, where can we, you know, how, what, what can we do? Like, what are the proteins that we can focus on? What, how can we get this to work? Um, but then once you have a specific structure, right? Once you have a specific structure, which is like the, um, the ACE2 targeting surface protein of this strain of coronavirus, um, or I guess COVID-19, once you have that, then it becomes a lot easier to develop a vaccine. And if you've already got the groundwork, well, then it's really just a matter of like plugging in a few details in the right spot and and then sort of, boom, you've, you've got the vaccine that you're looking for. Um, it's just harder to create a general purpose coronavirus vaccine. Um, so when the strain came, uh, it, it just became a lot easier. So that's really the thing is that if it really was like a lab leak, right? And if it was like, oh, they manufactured coronavirus, the American scientists would be screaming at the top of their lungs that, that that's what was happening. Um, and to be clear, the United States would at a minimum be partially to blame because like the United States was not only funding what was going on in that lab, but yeah. the United States also across the board is the number one state funder of uh, gain of function research. Yeah, because this the this the gain of function and felt you know I don't know if Fauci was funding this directly, but yes, we're definitely involved. But the, it it is you gotta admit that seems like I don't think it was necessarily manufactured for the point of like shutting the fucking world down because that makes no sense. It hurt it hurt them just as bad as it hurt us. It sucked, right? But I do think that it seems like this the lab in Wuhan, to my knowledge was shut down or at least had some sort of safety protocol violations in the past. So like when you put that those two factors together, it just seems a little suspicious. I mean, could, um, we, could we admit sort that? Of, um only if you're like okay, so I get how that would look suspicious if you're like looking from like an outside lens. But yeah, I, I definitely in am. terms of in terms of like like biosecurity, right? Like what my whole master's degree is about. Right. There's a reason why people have to get specific specializations for biosecurity, because just because somebody's like a really galaxy brain molecular biologist or cellular biologist or virologist doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to be super great at knowing how to follow all the protocols. Yeah. So, like, if you look at any like BSL three or four laboratory, there's going to be a handful of incidents um, and it's going to be a, basically any laboratory. Um, the United States actually. Uh, the last time I looked at the numbers had a disproportionately high rate of these mishaps. Um, and so they, yeah, like, like it, it's kind of like a, like it shouldn't be a normal thing, right? Because they should be taking it far more seriously, but it's one of those things that everybody needs to be taking more seriously across the board. Um, and it isn't like, you know, I guess it's not suspicious compared to like looking at like other laboratories around the world because Ultimately, like doctors get lazy and maybe they don't feel like putting on the positive pressure suit the right way or, you know, something like that. No, I definitely understand that. And I just I'm a conspiracy theorist, right? No, through and through. So it's kind of fun to think of it in those terms. And who knows? I, I kind of have my suspicions. 
Um, I'll definitely defer to you on this subject matter because you are by far superior in, uh, in knowledge to this. It's fun to think about, but I also would understand if there was a cover-up because gain-of-function research is 100% necessary for the future of our species because pandemics – there's going to be more of them, maybe not next. Well, good God, I hope this one's fucking over. But in the next, you know, maybe in the next hundred years, there's one. This is something that's plagued our species since time and memoriam. So being able to research these viruses and figure being a step ahead is incredibly important. And so I, I would understand if it did leak and there was a little bit of a cover up. But I don't know. It makes me feel better that you're like, yeah, that's, that probably didn't happen. You know, you just never know. But, I, you know, I go places, man. I'm crazy. So have you had a chance to step step foot in any of these labs? Um, No, no, I haven't. I went straight for my master's degree to uh, I, I went straight for my master's degree to like doing like political work and doing like the news. Like literally um, by the time I finished my master's degree, I was already making enough money streaming on Twitch that. That was just my full time job. Oh, that's a good job, man. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it's all, yeah. And a lot of biosecurity people will mostly be like planning, right? We'll be in like the, the sort of big nerd, like policy nerd side of things. Um, and uh, aren't necessarily the people who are like in the lab uh, doing like the, the random, you know, oh, I'm going to, you know, you know, genetically modify this thing. We're going to recombine, you know, particular viruses or whatever. Um, doing like the RNA synthesis and all those fancy, fancy fun things. Um, and the, the biosecurity folks are very much like if they show up at a lab, they're showing up at a lab with a clipboard to be like, is this air duct the right way? Is this doorway sealed the correct way? Are you following these procedures? You're the um, OSHA. Or they're, the, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, kind of. Yeah. You're the o, the OSHA guys of the science world. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool, man. I did, definitely didn't. I definitely didn't. I didn't even know that this was a was a thing, which is which is pretty awesome. Do you? I mean, when it comes to like bio defense and security, like what are the biggest threats? Because I'm gonna I'm gonna come at you with something that I'm terrified about prions dude they scare the shit out of me i think that that I, they terrify me i mean am i wrong is that our biggest threat or or um, is there something else i should be scared of that one like so you know how i was talking about like the lists of like most dangerous stuff mm -hmm. that one's not even really on the list um oh, thank god yeah um so you wouldn't have to worry too much about that um no i don't want to go too much into the detail about what the the highest risk situation is um just because like you know it's to like because because to say hey this is what the highest risk situation is it's sort of like giving people like a little bit of an instruction booklet and knowledge about everything to google um but the highest risk situ situation in my view um is a random person uh with a decent chunk of money i think the ballpark was about a hundred thousand oh, dollars um like basically making a particular strain of a particular virus with a mutation that is known and identified um, that would basically make an already incredibly like virulent disease, right? A very easy to spread disease, far more deadly and vaccine resistant, which is like one or two mutations um, that do could potentially lead to about like a third of people uh dying do we particularly have this thing under wraps through inoculation no god no or like what do you mean the non-mutated version the, the non-mutated version <laughs> yeah yeah okay i know exactly what you're talking about this has been in the news man They've talked about this before. I know it's been in the news, but I don't like broadcasting it, right? That's so that's, it's, that's fair. That's fair. There's a, yeah, it's it's you know, like I guess now they're at this point smallpox, right? Like yeah, but there's we're there. you know, yeah. Um it'd be really bad. It would be really bad. Um and like we have basically done nothing, right? Like 
like I had actually a conversation with a congressional representative. Um, I've actually had a conversation with a couple of different representatives, state level and congressional. Um, and I basically said like, Hey, this is a huge problem, but we could literally stop this by just requiring like background checks for people who want to buy DNA on the internet. Um, and the response I got from every single one of them was something along the lines of, I don't understand what you're talking about. I'll get back to you later. And they never do. Mm. Or why don't you run for office and you do it? Fuck me, man. I knew that that's what you would get, like that response. But it just, it kind of sucks hearing that. Th that is a big problem that we have is so many of our politicians just, I, I don't want to say they're stupid, but they, there's a lot of things that they, they're expected to understand or look into or research that they just don't do. They're so concerned about getting reelected and, and it feels like never doing anything good. Uh, there's just so many things that we haven't taken care of. We haven't, we haven't, we can't even balance our budget sheets. Right. Um, we we just had a disaster of a withdrawal. Like everything that we're doing just seems to be a disaster, which which all in line which falls in lines with uh, my belief that any anything the government touches turns to shit. Um, man, it's no interest at all from them. That I mean, that's not going to get them reelected, but zero from any of them. Well, no, I mean you, you said it right there. Emergency response doesn't get people elected, right? Emergency response because I mean, think about it, right? Think about it. Okay. We wouldn't be talking about a pandemic right now had we responded to this uh, coronavirus. Had we responded to coronavirus the same way we responded to SARS, nobody would be talking about it. People would be like, oh, yeah, that's right. It's a thing that, like, happened. Um, so, like, it wasn't a big election issue, right? You didn't see, like, George Bush running around in 2004 saying, like, we, we beat SARS. Okay, mission accomplished, right? He didn't do that. <laughs> he didn't do that. He wasn't campaigning on, we beat SARS. You don't know it, but literally half a million people could have died. Because um, people would be like, yeah, you say half a million people would have died, but is it really that bad? And then you see the opposite response, which is like, eh, let's pretend it's not happening. Um you know, honestly, from both Joe Biden and Donald Trump, right? They're both sort of pretending it's not happening, right? Um, and and then, yeah, you have hundreds of thousands of people are dying, and they're like, oh, there's nothing we could have done. But, like, there's so many things you could have done. Like, A, you didn't lock down, like, you know, airports. B, you didn't really do any contact tracing whatsoever, right? Like, like you know, all of these things, all of these things that they didn't do. And the reason they didn't do it is the same reason why Afghanistan was a disaster. It's the same reason all these other things are disasters because the World Trade Organization literally put out a memo, right? And a bunch of economists put out a memo after SARS and they said, this was all overblown. Um, look at how much money we lost because we shut down two cities for a few months. That's what they said, right? Wait, and... I'm so sorry to interrupt you. What was our response to SARS? Because I was a little kid. I remember seeing this in the news, but I have no fucking idea what we did. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so uh, what happened with SARS was basically um, they had traced basically everybody. So I think it was Hong Kong and Beijing basically shut down, like almost entirely. They shut down 100% lockdown. Um Every airport that had inbound flights took everybody's name who was on the flights and like called all of the people that they knew. Um, they had those people quarantined, so they weren't allowed to like interact with other people. All those people are quarantined. The healthcare professionals who are working with those patients quarantine themselves. And so basically anybody who was in a few feet of those people quarantined, anybody who showed symptoms would be quarantined. Um, and it was like, they took quarantine super, super seriously. It wasn't like, eh, self quarantine at home. No, it was like, if we catch you breaking quarantine, we will send a police officer to sit outside your doorstep and make sure that you're still quarantined. Um, because this is very serious. Um, and so, so they had that kind of response, but it was only ultimately like, you know, I think, think maybe like 2000 people or something like that ended up getting quarantined between Canada, uh, the United States and the UK. Um, 
because they were hyper vigilant about it. They were like, oh my God. And they shut down the entire city of like Hong Kong and Beijing. Um, this year, though, but this time, this time they were like, no, don't do that because like those two cities shutting down was like unbelievably expensive. Over the span of two months, they lost, oh, so many billion dollars. But that's the thing. Like SARS-1 really only lasted a couple months, right? Mm -hmm. And it only affected like maybe like two or three dozen people. Um, Like only two or three dozen people, I think, ended up like dying um, compared to what we have now. And so like a few months in just a couple cities with a couple thousand people outside of those major cities, right? Like shutting down like specific travel. um, Like, is it inconvenient? Yes. But is it worth it? Also, yes. Um, But they didn't know that at the time, right? These economists who are not public health experts wrote all these opinion pieces saying, we lost money and we can't bear to lose even a single dime. So how dare you? Um, so, and that's why when this happened again, you had the, the, those same economists rolling up saying, don't you dare shut down the economy. And there's actually like the EU, the European Union, when, when China was like, hey, we've got this mysterious virus, it could be SARS again. Um, the EU literally basically like sent them a letter saying like, don't you dare, don't you dare say that. Um, it's not. Um, don't tell anybody to wear a mask. Don't tell anybody to do any of these things. And then a month later, they were like saying the opposite thing, saying, why didn't Ch- China tell us about this earlier? And it's like, but China's like, well, before we even knew it was coronavirus, we told you about this and you told us not to do anything about it. So oh, shit. Well, keep your story straight, bro. So, dude, I had no idea. I had no idea that I was saying, shout out to fucking George Bush. How about G-Dub, dude, and Dick Cheney? Great. I had, dude, I literally had no idea. I had no clue. Is this well, in the same I think- show notes? What, what what probably is the testament to George Bush in that situation is that he, I don't think George Bush thought of himself as a very smart man, right? No. So if he's like, this this doctor man came here and told me that we need to shut down all these airports. And so I said, go for it. <laughs> Who needs airports anyway, right? Dick, Dick, like, Dick yeah, Dick, Dick Cheney. What, what do you think? What do you think, Dick? Come on now. You think we should do this? I think we should do it. Yeah. Fuck it. Let's just let's just let it ride. Let's let, yeah. let's let it ride. Yeah. So he's like, the doctor man's coming here to tell me to shut this down. You know, like, and so like, but you know, um, you know, you, then you have like Joe Biden and Donald Trump. Now they both think that they're too smart to listen to doctors. So. Yeah, yeah. I think that politi- uh, the, the this getting politicized is has has become the part of the issue. And I wish it wasn't that way. Um, it's tough for me because I'm so over it. I quit. I've quit paying attention. Um, and I got the shot, and uh, once I got the shot, I was like, "All right, I'm done. Like we're free. I'm I'm good." And and now I'm finding out that we've got a, a we've got the mask mandate back here, and I guess you're not supposed to wear masks outside. I just don't know what to do. I'm like, what, what does this mean? I don't know. I don't know. You know, yeah, I no, no fucking clue anymore. I feel like it's it's kind of out of control now. I don't know if we're ever going to be able to get the uh, the lid, the the genie back in the bottle. I was honestly saying that after the first six months, right? Because yeah. like the thing about coronaviruses, right? So, a there are strains of coronavirus that infect dogs and cats and a ton of other animal species that humans bump into on a regular basis. B if you're infected with two strains of coronavirus at the same time, they can recombine with each other, right? Oh, and that, they actually do lovely. so. Yeah, they do so at an incredibly high rate. Like it's it's actually kind of astonishing how easily coronavirus reassembles um like together. And there's different theories as to why and how. Um I'm a big proponent of the random assemblage theory, but that's like a whole different thing. That's like a whole different thing. Um uh there there's some some we don't quite know um, on that level, but we know that there's a high rate of recombination. And that high rate of recombination, you could have like a cat that could get coronavirus from you and also be carrying a benign strain of coronavirus. But then those two strains could combine with each other and then come back to you. And all of a sudden you've got a brand new strain and now we need a whole new vaccine. 
And that happens at such a high rate that if you don't keep coronavirus under control, um, you just have to keep coming out with new vaccines every year like we do with the flu, except for the mortality rate is six times as high. Yeah, so we're fucked is basically what you're saying. I'm good with that. I mean, there are, keep your keep just be healthy, work out, eat right. I don't know. We can't we can't do this forever. That's obviously not viable. You know, it's it's one of those things. We kind of had our chance. We miffed it, and this is we live in a new world now. But it's, I feel like at this point, everyone's kind of got like a little bit of news fatigue, Corona fatigue, and I don't know. I just. I think we all just kind of want to move on because I, I don't know. It's, I, I feel like this is going to continue to go on as long as we let it. I don't, it's not, it's here to stay. I mean, I, I don't know when we're going to admit that to ourselves. I mean, it sounds like you, you're kind of on the same, the same camp than I am right now. Yeah. I mean, I'm a big proponent of like, look, if you're in a crowded space, right. If you're a crowded space, especially if you're indoors, you know, mask up, uh, get vaccinated. Um, but like, unless we like, cause we could stop coronavirus if we really wanted to, we could stop coronavirus. Right. But what it would take is shutting down everything. Everybody stays at home and you basically, it would, it would basically be like everything shuts down except for like Amazon and Amazon would have to deliver like a box of groceries to every person every week for about two months. And then we'd be in the clear. Um, but obviously giant companies are not excited about that. They don't want that idea, right? They, they think that's a bad idea. Um, that's basically what Vietnam is doing right now, where, um, they'd held off the pandemic for a very long time. Uh, then they started opening up travel again. When people started traveling, pandemic starts coming back there. Um, and, but then when it starts spreading through a city, they shut down the entire city and they just deliver food to people's doors and they say, stay at home. Um, and only the bare minimum people, like actual essential workers, not like in like the United States where it's like, oh, you're the ice cream cone mascot at Baskin Robbins. <laughs> you're very essential. No, like just actual like bare bones, minimum essential workers. Um, and, and they've managed to, despite having a third of the population of the United States, only have, I think, 1800 total deaths of coronavirus. And most of them happened just recently because... Their economy is strained because while they were doing the right thing, everybody else was doing the wrong thing, and they still have coronavirus at the gates waiting for them until they all get vaccinated. Yeah, but I mean, even if you're vaccinated, though, like oh, this is the thing that's always got me. Like, if I'm back vaccinated, why should I wear a mask? Like, I feel like my deal was I've done my thing. Like, can I be done now? I, I, I that's something I still struggle with. I, 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 I understand. That you can still get it. Um, there seems to be a lot of cases of people that are vaccinated contracting coronavirus, but it's not going to kill you. And I guess you can still spread it. So, like, what is the point? I don't, you know what I mean? Does that, that kind of make sense? Yeah, I mean, the point really is to, like, reduce the mortality rate, right? Like, and yeah. that's that's really the goal, is is reducing the mortality rate to the point where if... The mortality rate with vaccinated, like with vaccinated people, is something closer to the mortality rate of something like the flu. Then that's sort of the calculated risk of like, yeah, we just accept this as a normal thing, though. Okay. Uh, but like, you know, um, that requires like everybody to get vaccinated. Yeah. And we have a lot of people who, instead of getting vaccinated, would like to take horse medicine. Yeah, yeah, ivermectin. So I other so like, I get the fear is the people that aren't vaccinated, like the reason people would want me to wear a mask is like, well, it's going to continue to mutate and then your vaccination will be worthless. But I'm not now I'm not, I'm confused as to whether it's worthless or not. I just don't know. Like it's annoying to talk about it. I, I, I value 
and I respect people's decision not to get vaccinated. The argument to me seems to be compressing, especially with the FDA now approving Pfizer, right? Like if that was your fear, then it's approved. That never was really a factor to me because I've done drugs and I'm willing, definitely going to do steroids at some point and a bunch of other shady shit, 100% that is not FDA approved. So I was never really afraid of that. But um, for the people that are, Pfizer's approved. But I mean... I, I I like the individuality of people to think differently. Um, whether I agree with them or not, that's one thing. But I do like that it's there. I think that that's what makes our country so amazing and, and kind of fucking frustrating at times. You're also looking at it from a completely different lens. Um, you know, so I would understand if you kind of deviated uh, in my thought process. But I also think that. I don't know. Like, if if you're not vaccinated, I'm not going to hate you. And I kind of wish we would, like, I kind of wish that narrative would calm the fuck down a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I don't you might know. Be on the, I, you might be on the other I, side of that. I'm kind of on the other side of that. And, and the argument that, that works for me really is the, you know, I don't think people have a right to carry deadly diseases around with them. Because at that point, they're exposing other people, right? And that's really where the situation is, right? Because if you were an island and you're a hermit and you're living in the middle of nowhere and you literally never see anybody ever um, and you're not vaccinated, that's not going to hurt anybody. But, and like, this is what, this is what's important to understand about vaccines, right? Vaccines, va vaccines are not designed to necessarily work at the individual level at the way people think that means, right? Like people think that, Vaccine means I have a shield that stops anything from hitting me. But in reality, it's like it's like a vaccine is just changing the probability, right? It's like it's like having advantage, right? Do you play Dungeons and Dragons? I have. Um having a vaccine is like having an advantage on your saving throw, right? It's it's like yeah. having advantage on your saving throw. That's really what it is. Is is being vaccinated is having advantage. Um and so you can have it, you can roll with advantage and still lose. Um, and then if you look at like passing it on to another person and they don't have advantage, well, then the chance of them losing is higher, right? But if everybody's rolling with advantage, right? And if everybody has to lose, um, then you're in a lot better situation if everybody is vaccinated, right? Yeah. Um, and I, I might be like sort of butchering this metaphor a little bit. Um, but basically, the most important thing when it comes to disease spreading is um, what are the odds that somebody who is susceptible bumps into somebody that is carrying the virus? Um, and susceptibility is a percent chance. Um, so like with a 95% vaccination rate, that is where you would start to see coronavirus sort of fade away. Um, 70% you see it, its numbers go lower and maybe stabilize at something low. Uh, but anything lower than that, it sort of hits this threshold factor where every day if you bump into 100 people and half of those people aren't vaccinated and half of those people could be spreading coronavirus, your chances of bumping into somebody and getting coronavirus uh, is pretty high. And it's not just one chance. Right, you have to make a saving throw every time you bump into somebody who's spreading coronavirus. And even with advantage, sometimes if you're rolling again and again, uh, you lose. And so, like the idea is to give everybody advantage so that the amount of times you have to roll is lower, so that the success rate is far higher. That makes sense. I'm with you on that. I want to get your opinion on the withdrawal that has occurred one of the things i mean it seems like uh the left kind of was really pissed off at biden like this is a very disappointing thing i, I felt like for the first time we kind of got some i don't know i guess equal reporting on the matter everyone seems to be pissed off um i just kind of wanted to know what your your opinion is on this and, and what we could have done better yeah, I mean, honestly, the one thing that we should have done better, because like, it's a good, like, let's be clear, it's a good thing that we pulled out, right? There, like, we had no 100%. business in Afghanistan, right? We had no business in Afghanistan, you know, like, it's just, it, it, it was a, it was a pain, there wasn't really clear goals, 
the one sort of clear goal that they had said they accomplished 10 years ago. Um, and, and the issue, the, the problem, right, with Joe Biden's response ultimately is, I feel like, just revealing of sort of what America's policy towards Afghanistan has been this whole time, which is not really about the people of Afghanistan, right? We weren't in Afghanistan out of like benevolence to the people of Afghanistan. Um, uh, we were there because the United States had economic interests, financial interests, right? Whether that be like defense contractors or different industries that wanted to be in Afghanistan. Um, that's, that's why we were there. And so when the United States pulled out, it was very much like pulling the rug out of under the people uh, who were said we were going to be working with, who those companies said that they were going to be working with. Um, because they're like, yeah, whatever, You're, we're not making money off you anymore, so whatever, let's go. Um, and that's that's the problem, right? That's the problem. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't that they pulled out, it's that they just, you know, left people there. Um, and they didn't really have, like, a real program in place to fly people out. Um, and even now, Joe Biden's saying he's, you know, after getting a wave of criticism, uh, is saying, oh, well, we have 70,000 people that we've taken out now and as refugees. Um, and that's cool. But if you also look at the process that they're doing, right, they're like trying to make this complicated bureaucratic process. Um, and it's, there's just this obsession. There's just an obsession with bureaucracy and like this means testing everything where they're like, oh, well, you actually have to be like this perfect person with all of these things and you have to have these credentials or whatever. And then here you go. Um, instead of just like, here's a line number, uh, get on the plane, we'll figure it out once you once you get to the United States, once you get to Germany, whatever country you're going to, Canada, whatever. Um, here's a line number, we'll figure out once you get there. Um, like they they just like can't help themselves but put in place like all this bureaucratic nonsense. Yeah, yeah, it's it hasn't been good. I mean, the, the definitely the reasons for going were to to root out terrorism after the nine eleven attacks. So we got Bin Laden, and then from there we probably should have begun the process of leaving because no no country. No civilization has ever been able to hold that that strip, that patch of land. It bogged down the British, the Russian, Alexander the Great, you name it. It's called the Graveyard of Empires for a reason, man. And <clears throat> one of the things I think DeMarco and I talked about, we didn't even extract any of uh, well, this is also terrible. I have to keep saying this as a caveat. There's a billion, trillions, billion, I don't even know, a shit ton of resources, lithium, all that stuff. We We got none of it. None of it. Um, so, I mean, that leads us to believe that they were potentially just doing it maybe for opium. I know, I know we were guarding opium fields and shit, but, like, it literally, like, I don't know. I don't want to say any of those those troops died in vain, but, like, it just seems like such a waste. And it's 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 a good thing that we're out of there. I just wish we would have gotten out in a, in a, in a, in a better – in a better light. And I don't really know – what the steps are. I mean, someone proposed the idea that we go in, and, but I don't, I mean, that's, I don't know. That we, We'd go in, secure the air areas and make sure that we, we held these areas, these airports and whatnot until we got everybody out. But it's a fucking mess, man. That's for sure. And I, de I definitely think that we look really, really bad in the world right now. And that's upsetting. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I don't think the U.S. has looked particularly good in the world, um, like for a while, for for yeah, yeah, for a pretty pretty long time to say the very least. Um, I mean, yeah, no, I mean, ultimately, um, you know, I mean, as far as the resources concerned, I don't think it's the United States' business to even really get those resources, other than through like you know positive trade relations and like cooperation. Um, at this point, like really what's happening is kind of wild to see like the Taliban is trying to set itself up as this sort of modern, like m not modern, uh, moderate government. They're trying to set themselves up at it where they're like, no, 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 we're, we're super moderate. Don't worry. Um, and obviously there's going to be internal conflict because that's not necessarily how they were pitching themselves to the people <laughs> they were recruiting in the streets, uh, yeah. you know, a few, few months ago. Right. And so, 
Um, but no, they're trying to do like, no, look at us. We're doing garbage services now. We're setting up, you know, power lines and electric services and, and doing all these things. And like, ultimately, ultimately, like the political situation in Afghanistan should be up to the people of Afghanistan, right? Yeah. Um, and what happens with like the natural resources there should be like based off of like what the people there, you know, think should be done with it. 100%. Um, and then in terms like I know you're not gonna say it, but like I will say it. Like I think that like basically pretty much every American soldier that died in Afghanistan, that yeah, that was, you know, unfortunately, the truth is those people died in vain. The whole purpose of the war was to basically make money for defense contractors. That's why we were in there for so long. That's why the entire system, I mean, when I was working with drones. There was very much a mentality of we have to fly X number of flights today. We have to drop X number of bombs today. We have to do like we got numbers to hit. Like, does it matter what we do to get those numbers? No, we just got to get those numbers. Why? Because Raytheon wanted a contract, right? Because, you know, Boeing, Lockheed Martin, they all wanted contracts. And those contracts meant dropping bombs. It meant doing flights. It meant buying new aircraft, all those things. And that is how the incentive structure internally in the military works, just to make sure that people's promotions are dependent on flying missions and dropping bombs. Uh, and then the sort of targets was always kind of like a secondary afterthought, like, oh, maybe we should focus on like picking strategic targets as long as there's enough to buy all the bombs we need. That's so dark. I can't say that they died in vain because you have the 9-11 attacks. I can't bring myself to say that, unless you're ultra conspiracy theory and you think that, that was bullshit too, which, hey, on this podcast, who knows? But I'm not a truther, so I can't say that, but I definitely think the, think the longer occupation, and there is there is truth in what you say. We are an industrial military complex and that is the sad truth and it, it's just it's tough because i have some very very strong patriotic leanings like i'll fucking drink the kool-aid man i love america but there are a lot of problems and our foreign policy has been awful it's been atrocious since the after World War II, right, into the 50s. We've done some pretty dumb things. And I, I don't know why we keep falling into the same trap of, like, trying to nation build. And, I mean, I'm optimistic that maybe we've learned our lesson and we won't stick our nose where it doesn't belong. Mar don't you dare shake your head, DeMarco. Uh, but, like, you're <laughs> fucking, everyone's laughing at me. Uh, but I hope, I hope that maybe this is the dawn of a new era. Maybe we've learned our lesson. Maybe we'll balance the budget and we'll figure it out. We'll s redirect all that money back home, invest in the communities that need investment in, and you know we're going to rebuild our infrastructure. That's the optimistic take on this podcast, and everyone is laughing at me right now, but hopefully that's what happens. It's not going to. Yeah, I mean, that would, be, that would be ideal, right? That would be ideal. Um, but unfortunately, like... It really looks right now to me that they're just looking at like how can we ramp up a cold war with China at this point and like that's their they're like already like uh like going down that route. Um oh, and to be clear, you mentioned um like I'm sorry, but like you mentioned 9/11, but it's important to remember that 9/11 was a retaliation, right? 9/11 was a retaliation, right? Like yes. they targeted the World Trade Center for a reason, right? They didn't crash into the Statue of Liberty. They were like they flew into the headquarters of then, I think it was the IMF had its headquarters there. And the reason why they did it is because the IMF was like forcing austerity measures on like basically all over the world. And so like it was this horrific evil thing that happened in the United States, but it also was, was sort of the consequence of already happening American imperialism in that region. I just wanted to add, also, don't forget that in uh, several of the other buildings, the CIA, the FBI, the NSA, and I think the Fed and one other big agency had offices or data centers within that complex. Wow. Whoops. Um, 
That's a lot. Yes, we're let's get to the Cold War in China. Um, it's I mean, heat up. Yeah, this shit's heating up. All of our. I just had this conversation the other day, and it was very enlightening and also very scary because um, Laszlo is of the opinion that we've pretty much already lost this thing. Um, what are your thoughts on on that statement? Um, I think that assessment would be correct. I think Fuck! the United States has like. I like, I mean, the United States lost the Cold War with China probably like four years ago. Um, yeah, maybe even longer. Uh, because I mean, I mean, think about it. Like, if you look at the map of like major trade partners around the world, um, let's say the United States declares war and wants to go to, to war with China tomorrow, um, the United States would literally run out of bombs in three months because all China would need to do is like go to their trade partners and say, "We're going to put sanctions on the United States. Nobody can send them X, Y, Z precious metals." And without those precious metals, the United States completely runs out of bombs, ammunition, all the material it needs to upkeep, like the warships and things like that. Because it takes a lot of work to keep a warship alive, right? Like, yeah, if you've got, like, an aircraft carrier, you have to have, like, a hundred other support things to make that thing possible, right? To keep that thing afloat, it takes, like, tons and tons of resources. So if that stops, it's not like the United States has this giant stockpile of bombs, right? It's It's very much just like just like how we ran out of toilet paper at Target, right? Because there was a little bit of a rush. Um, it's the same like as needed delivery system for like the munitions that the United States has. And uh, so, no, the United States has already lost the Cold War. And it's really just like American politicians are just trying to cope with the fact and they just can't conceptualize it, right? Because in so their minds, you know, we, we have, yeah. We have an as needed delivery because I know we have a nuclear arms stockpile, but like just general bombs, we have an as needed like supply chain for the, those types of things. We don't have any munition stockpile. I mean, we have to have oh, no, some, no. but I mean, a large scale industrial war, obviously, we'd need to t t turn the factories back on in the Midwest and start cranking stuff out. But we don't have enough munitions like we're i did not i want to look into that i did not know that that's well that's and to be clear i don't think we should have more munitions right i think that it's ridiculous to start a war with china because like like china's trade policy is very much one of it has a policy of non-intervention right like like china will work with the socialists in bolivia and it'll work with you know the extreme right winger duterte China is like, you do you, we will not try to influence your policy. All we ask is that we give you these favorable trade deals and you just let us build some roads and trains. Uh, is that cool? And so they're literally, um, they're playing the nice guy, right? Because the United States has been out there like playing this like tough guy who's like, oh yeah, look at us, you know, if you don't do our trade deals, then we're going to bomb your country. And then China's like, hey, how about we do trade deals with you? And then if we do these trade deals, then the Americans won't be able to bomb you because we'll be able to threaten them with sanctions. And so all we want is some roads and trains. Uh, is that cool? And so that like their whole foreign policy strategy is playing the nice guy. And it literally has been for thousands of years. I mean, it's literally one of the first emperors of China was like, we're going to send people gold and treasure, and then they will be friends with us so that we can you know, make money in the long run. Well, it's a hundred percent. That's a their manufacturing base is. I mean, we just talked about that yesterday. It's been going on for like two thousand years. They've been a manufacturing powerhouse. And then, what's really what I've been looking into is how deep, how many roots they have into Africa. They just built the African Union, this massive building. Um, and pull that up. I'm gonna be talking about my ass on this one, Demarco. But I believe they built the African Union. This massive building they gave them uh, they've started developing certain countries with trains and roads and they did spy on that building in the african union they put because uh, they had all the computer servers in there and they figured out that a lot of their information was going back to a server in beijing and they had to root that out they but to be to be fair they did offer to replace the new servers with more of the chinese servers and they a, the African Union declined. Go ahead, DeMarco. Uh, so that is true. They did in 2009. They built that building. But also in their defense, the United States has built in backdoors into literally every nation's computer network. Oh, for and sure, bro. Everyone's doing so it. So it's like, this is just the Game of Thrones everybody does. Yeah. It's um, it's interesting. I don't know. I you, you, are, you bring up a very interesting point that I haven't really... Uh, 
I guess played with that much is the fact that they could be seen as like the savior for all these countries that maybe we are sanctioning and that we've that are pissed off at us and they're they're cutting better deals and maybe they're like they're the least oppressive overlord that we have like I I kind of like working with the Chinese more than we do the Americans which is fucking terrifying it is cuz I don't necessarily I don't like one of the things I don't like the oppressiveness and the and the and the the spying that their government does on their citizens and we we got into that yesterday but they're also at an advantage and i've said this a million times but their society is ran by scientists and engineers and ours are ran by lawyers and they don't have to worry about an election policy they have to worry about – so a lot of their strategies that they've been employing for the past 20 years has been long-term, and it's beginning to pay off, and we are so far behind um, in that regard. It's, it's, it doesn't look good, and it bothers me that we don't seem to, as a, as a country, and our polit- – they don't seem to really understand, like, kind of – how far behind we are and kind of, I, it just doesn't seem like anyone gives a shit. Yeah. I mean, really ultimately, because like the thing is they just don't have a solution for it. Right. Like they don't have like, like China has the centrally planned economy, right. When they're like, okay, we're going to build high speed rail and it's going to be accessible. Um, and that's what we're going to do. Right. We're going to like, here's a city, here's a city. People need to go from A to B. We're not going to bother really building too much in the way of highways. Like, we'll build a highway. But let's build high-speed rail. Let's put it in the most efficient place. Let's, you know, make sure that we've got green space, like, really designing the cities. Um, and then they're like, you know, we're not going to let those NIMBYs get in the way, right? Because everybody's like, oh, I don't want a train station in my neighborhood. It's too loud. Well, too bad. It's more efficient. It's energy efficient. It's just a better way to do it. It costs less to maintain than like a 12-lane highway. So I'm sorry. It's just going to happen. Um, and then when it happens, people are like, oh, this is fine. This is fine. Um, and, uh, you know, in the United States, right, you try to build high-speed rail. You have 800 people with 800 different ideas, six different companies that want to make a profit off of it. And then you've got like like angry random people in the suburbs who are like, my cat likes to walk across the street. And if I ha- if there was a train there, I don't know what I would do with that. Like, and it's like, come on, <laughs> you know, like we could just trains, please trains, you know, like uh, and that's. Uh, you know, and so like Joe Biden just can't cope with that, right? Joe, like they, and, and, you know, both liberals and conservatives have a difficult time coping with the idea that like, you know, maybe in some ways it's actually more efficient to have a centrally planned economy where you're like, no, we're just going to do this. Um, and it's, it's, it's just going to work like straight up. Um, you know, like they refuse to learn the lesson that Amazon learned. That's like, Hey, look, Amazon itself internally is a centrally planned economy that's like super efficient. Um, you know, China's doing that, except for they're like, how about we do this, except for it's owned by the government so that it's not one dude profiting off of it and we can do it at a lower cost without having to worry about like profit margins. Uh, so it's, it's free public transit, basically. And that that is their strategy to like lower the cost of living because China's goal over the past 50 years basically has been to eliminate extreme poverty. That's basically their number one goal. It's one of the reasons why they're doing all these trade deals is uh, because they're like, um, you know, hey, we, you know, we will we'll produce things for the rest of the world. They'll give us some money. We'll use that money to get all the resources we need to develop our economy so that we can get people out of poverty. We can build houses really fast and, and just get to the point where, you know, we don't have like homelessness and people starving in the streets. Once we get to that point, then we figure out, you know, some of the other stuff. And that's why, like, if you talk about like, oh, but in China, they have less civil liberties. Basically, everything along the, those lines um, is put under, they have popular support, right? Like their mass surveillance, right? In the United States, we have mass surveillance and everybody hates it. In China, it actually has a little bit of popular support because basically what happens is the politicians turn to the people and they say, the United States is literally threatening to bomb us. Okay, the United States is literally threatening to bomb us all the time. The CIA does all these ridiculous operations around the world. We need to defend against that. And that means that as a community, we all have to make a little bit of a sacrifice 
Um, and that's why, that's why, you know, we have so many people working in these factories to produce things for America, because if they're addicted to $5 t-shirts, then they can't drop bombs on our country because then they don't have any more t-shirts. Um, and so like, uh, so that's really the situation where the, the government of China has a lot of popular support and a lot of it has to do with how aggressive the United States has been towards China, um, giving them a lot of leeway to say, well, we're going to do all these things. Um, and as long as they keep doing what they're doing in terms of eliminating extreme poverty, getting people housed and fed, um, or like what they did during the coronavirus pandemic, where they literally built like dozens of hospitals, as long as people see those things and those amenities in their lives and those like simple comforts, uh, people are fine with it. Um, the United States doesn't operate like that. The United States no. is like, no, we need to ruthlessly pursue every dollar, even if that means like everybody dying of coronavirus. It's... It's, I mean, these are two distinct cultures, right? I mean, it's, I feel like as much as, as it's an economic war, it's also a semi com, uh, 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 culture war, right? I mean, this is, they're coming from a collectivistic culture where something like this makes sense. And we're coming from a very individualistic culture where it's like, we're all like, we're out for ourselves. And, and, um, but I also, I honestly feel like, the, the collectivistic culture and the fact that they have been a world power in the past. They were for thousands of years, right? Like, and the, the amount of things they brought to the world, this resurgence of power is nothing new. It's, if, it, if anything, it's, it's kind of the norm, right? And so I, it's, it's very interesting. The past 200 years, they've been down, and now they're finally at this position to be to get this respect and the prestige, the prestige that they've had in the past. And I, I don't know. I mean, if we continue going the way that we're going, being incredibly divisive, and and I don't think that we can challenge that. I'm 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 not sure, but it's. I definitely respect you. You brought up several points that I haven't thought about. Um, uh, certain things I knew, especially with the, the building of hospitals. We've done none of that during this pandemic. Fucking none of it. And we were supposed to. We, we shut down hospitals. They went bankrupt. There were hospitals that were like, if we can't do these, you know, if we can't do these high budget, um, like, uh, Oh shoot! What are they called? Like optional surgeries? They're not called optional. Not cosmetic. They're like the elective surgeries. Elective. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. If we can't do these elective surgeries, um, then then we can't keep the hospital running. So we shut down hospitals all over the United States, especially in rural areas, uh, because it wasn't profitable enough <laughs> <laughs> during a pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck me, man. That's crazy. Well, dude, I want to be respectful of your time. So I've, I want you to thank you so much for doing this. I'm going to have you on again. I, I like your I like your viewpoints. Um, I don't think we agree on everything, but we can still talk about it. And I've learned a lot. Um, so I really appreciate you coming on the show. Where can people find you? Yeah, so on Twitch, I'm Bleep Blomp Ben. Um, I know it's it's kind of a complicated thing. Bleep Blomp Ben. Otherwise, on Twitter, you can find me at just Benjamin Carollo. Um, I'm also on the Young Turks channel, Rebel Headquarters, so you can see some of my videos there. Um, just search the name Benjamin Carollo, and you're probably going to find me somewhere. All right, man. Appreciate it.